Thanks for coming. We, uh, before we get on with a, a small slideshow here, I'd like to acknowledge our eldest inventor, who was um, a uh, president of the association for many years. And uh, Buzz, would you pop up here, please? Can we welcome Buzz Cousins? <laughs> only 91. He's got a little bit of inventing to do yet. Um, and uh, you know, Buzz uh, did, had a lot of inventions, uh, some of that we've heard of before. Um, he's been a, he, he really established in Australia uh, associations like this in each state that was attributable to Buzz doing that. And uh, we are really the strongest of all the states uh, West Australia is not too bad at the moment, but uh, that was that was Buzz who did that. And uh, I've just asked Buzz if he could just give us a quick address as to what you know inventing meant to him or what's happened over the years. Uh, you want to give us a couple of words, Buzz? Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> How many of you are inventors who've not yet patented an idea, but you've got a good idea you want to do something? <laughs> Nine. Nine. And what have you done about it? <laughs> have you made prototypes to prove that your idea isn't just a figment of your imagination, but it will actually work? 
How many have done that of those nine? A couple. Well, that's the first thing to do, really. If you've got a good idea, make a prototype to prove that it will do the job you think it should do. And then, if you can't uh, do the making of it yourself, if you've all got children, send them to school to do an apprenticeship so they can make up their own ideas. Keep it in the family. And that's a good way to get your invention prototype manufactured. Otherwise, it's going to cost you a lot of money to pay somebody else to do it for you. But if you have got uh, a prototype, bring it along and see Peter, who's the boss of the Feasibility <coughs> Committee of the Inventors Association. He and his team of expert inventors will try to help you to get that idea past the prototype stage. If you can get it past that stage and start uh, register a small business name yourself and start manufacturing them, show your prototype to people who might be interested in buying it and try to get an order. That's what I did. Within three days of making my first prototype of an idea, which worked, I had a government order from the Postmaster General's department for seven models. Within a week that was increased to ten. Within three weeks I manufactured from my prototype and delivered them. And that started me in my own business and carried on from there and I manufactured 800 models. They're all over the world now and they're doing a, still doing a good job of work. Only last week I heard of one I'd supplied to the Chief of Police in Melbourne, which is still working in the main ma mail room of the police commission here in Melbourne. It keeps on working and does the job. And that was working from a prototype and getting one small order and then I produced 800 and sold them worldwide. But I did all that myself. <coughs> converted it from a prototype into something which could be manufactured on equipment available by other companies around me and I got six companies manufacturing parts so that I could assemble my own production <coughs> models. And that was a good way to do it because it meant I wasn't relying on royalties from somebody, I was doing it myself. That's what you should try to do or keep it in the family. Get somebody in the family to help you. A good way to do it. <coughs> it's very, it's pleasing to see so many of the old members of the Inventors Association here tonight. I can see about ten different faces of people I know who were here in the Inventors Association, like Bill Allardyce with his Aussie Chopsticks. Has anybody seen those? <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous inventions. Good on you, Bill. Good on you, Bill. Um, Malcolm? Malcolm. Malcolm Hickman. Another good old inventor. Um, what next day? Yes. Colin Wood. Colin Wood? What is it? Colin Wood. Colin Wood, yes. Uh, Excuse me, but I had a stroke and my memory is a bit chopped up, so uh, not to worry. Um, but it's good to come along and see so many of the, the old inventors are still here and still on their feet, which is good. Um, to see the models of various inventions around here is lovely. I congratulate... Um, Debbie. 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 Debbie Day. Um, she has a model of her invention there, the children's um, box of, of tricks. 
an ideal thing, and she's already nearly up to a hundred of those she sold already by getting it done herself. And this is what you've all got to try to do. All the other people here who are not yet members of the Inventors Association, why aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> that is the membership that keeps the association going. It's the small amount of fee from him being a member of the association which helps to provide the facilities, keeps the website running, keeps the inventors meetings every month running, and all done through members' subscriptions. A good thing. So more of you should be joining, and I think somebody should go along and take all your names tonight <laughs> and send you a, an application. <coughs> <laughs> Who's going to do that? Who's the secretary now, mate? Right? <laughs> We've done it already. <laughs> You're the secretary now? No, no, Peter Barrett is our secretary. Right. You are? Yes. Oh, there's a job for you. Right? Name of everybody here. Send them an application form in the mail yes. with a pre stamp envelope for their address. <laughs> See how many you can get. <laughs> oh, excuse me a second. Peter said that I helped to start all the associations in each state. I wrote the Articles of Association for all the different states and the territories, and we uh, had a meeting, a meeting of all the um, chairmen of those branches, came down to Melbourne, we got them all together and gave them their new rules, and they started the association. There were hundreds and hundreds of members all around the, the different states. The biggest was in Sydney. And when we shot the president in Sydney, because he didn't quite do the right thing, he had over a thousand members. <coughs> but those members were mainly from Victoria and South Australia. And he was collecting all the membership fees of all those members and using it all in New South Wales. <laughs> so we thought, no, in future we'll have a new um, association in each state and encourage everybody to collect their own membership fees and look after their own uh, associations. And that has worked and is still working here in Victoria, which is good. And I congratulate the current committee for doing a good job of work. Here, here. This is the president. <laughs> Buzz, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's great to, to hear from you. Uh, it's great to see you still out and about. And uh, uh, it, it was a good talk. Thank you. Okay, um, what I'd like to do now is just go over uh, what, we, what happened during the last year. Um, in February, we had Lauren Riley, inventor, entrepreneur, oops, I've got to get some notes here. Inventor, entrepreneur, swimmer, lecturer, and equity crowdfunding startup. Um, Lauren is a little dynamo in the mid-30s and uh, she has uh, been all of those things. She told us at that monthly meeting um, about her father, first of all, uh, Lauren had invented some products and sold them. And Lauren told us about her dad, Greg McDougall, who invented an electric toothbrush, which was marketed around the globe by Colgate, was the biggest selling seller globally for over a decade. Colgate made hundreds of thousands of electric toothbrushes each month for around 10 years. And um, her father used to live in Hong Kong and he knew, uh, he used to design the products, uh, hair care products and products similar to this. And he knew the manufacturers and he knew the distributors. You know, they were just, just a, a building away. And he would um, sell them off and get it up and, and running. By the way, 
this Colgate uh, uh, business didn't happen overnight. In fact, he licensed it all around the world, practically except America, before Colgate finally came on board. I mean, Colgate dominated the market around the world after that. So it took a while. Uh, Lauren then told us about innovation and how um, there are two processes to innovation, invention, which, is, which creates new knowledge, and entrepreneurship, which transforms new knowledge into new value. <coughs> so she was all about you know, entrepreneurship and how inventors can you know, develop value. She told us that uh, world statistics show 98% of pitches from startup businesses to investors fail, which is a huge loss to entrepreneurship. And Lauren's new venture, Startup Crowdfunding, will teach people how to design their business to be in the 2% who are investor <coughs> Um And she has helped a number of us here. Now in March we had Debbie Dash show us her product Toybo, which I'm sure that you've all seen over here with a very good display. Um, it's a storage solution originally for preteen girls and now for boys gaming needs too and a host of other very worthwhile solutions with this product. Um, there's Debbie presenting her product to us at the uh, meeting in March. Debbie chose to make the toy boat completely from cardboard. This has many advantages over a plastic model because it could be flat pack and it could be painted in colours such as bright pink, which is her daughter's favourite colour. Uh, cardboard also made toy boat very light, 7.7 kilograms, so it could be easily repositioned and removed and easily carried from a store. More about that later when we interview uh, Debbie. Um, also in March, uh, we had a Subaru challenge because uh, we got in touch with the manufacturer um, and uh, they sent us some samples in January. We handed those out and people were asked to come back, make something, come back and show us what they made and we had just a little vote you know, in the room. Jack Karen won uh, with this product. He got a little bit uh, tired of uh, chafing his fingers on the screw top bottle because I think that he drinks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right, Jack? You well, drinks enough. <laughs> and uh, so he made the little uh, mould there. Uh, you mould the product and then it, it sets and uh, it's still rubber, but it sets in that you know, configuration. So that was a bit of fun. We had a few other products too made from that. Lauren Riley came back in February to talk to us about the Opportunity Act, which develops your punchline for investors. Uh, she took three of our inventors, so one at a time, and then went through on the board how the app works, how you do it. She shared the app with us. We could download it for free from her website. We could play with that and uh, uh, try to develop a, a value statement uh, about ourselves from that. Um, she talked about Lots and lots of things, um, you know, more things than, than we could ever remember. But luckily we videotape it all, put it on YouTube so our members can download it and have a look at it again and go through it in detail. She talked about the value statement. Um, we're very impressed with Lauren's work because inventors need a good value statement about themselves, their product and their business to interest potential distributors, investors, <coughs> or prospective purchasers of the intellectual property. When we have this value statement ready to roll up our tongues, we have a better chance of our prospective purchasers thinking, wow, at the first meeting, and that's what we really need. So uh, she sort of told us how to do that. In April, we had Osaka doing technical drawings, showing us how, to, uh, how he can draw um, products for us. It's not fair that we got him to do this on the whiteboard because he is a fat whiteboard marker and the guy uses um, a, a number of uh, devices, um, circular things for drawing proper circles and line drawings and many neat, uh, you know, items for felt tip pens and so forth. <laughs> and um, this is more like what he does. But uh, for inventors, it meant that you didn't have to get a prototype made if you didn't want to. You could Go to a sucker, tell him roughly what you wanted, he could draw it up. 200 bucks, he could do that for you, and uh, that's uh, sometimes, you know, he could do the, the perspective views underneath and around without looking at anything. But you need to give him some guidance. And um, so it was another way that we could present our invention to people uh, without having to actually make a prototype. 
And he told us too for our service manuals or, or other things, he could do pass breakdowns, which is what he really specialises in for large companies. And he hand draws all the pass breakdowns because he said 3D CAD drawings don't do it properly in, in the right perspective of, of every part. He can twist the part with his drawing, but it's sometimes difficult to do all those uh, correctly in the 3D CAD. <coughs> then we had Lynn Williams, uh, our committee member. Lynn talked to us about um, uh, the um, grants, the research and development grants, and um, he gave us a lot of information on those grants through the slides. He did a whole you know, presentation to us showing us how we can obtain $10,000 virtually free from the ATO, so the Australian Tax Office. Now, um, he went through this in, in quite a lot of detail. Once again, we could go through the video and find out how to do that. Um, afterwards, uh, just uh, last month, Len took the initiative to ask um, ATCS, which is Australian Tax uh, Concessions Systems, to uh, <coughs> ask them if they would like to be a sponsor of our association, and they said yes. So they were paying us money, they're our sponsor now, our paid sponsor, and um, as they say there, 100% success rate. Now, if you're not doing it correctly, they'll, they'll tell you how to do it until you do it correctly so that you will get the money. And um, so ATS are now our uh, official sponsors. We have two other sponsors um, who don't pay us, but they give us services uh, for um, discounts, which is um, Gary Hegedus Productions and uh, businessplans.com.au. Uh, Gary Hegedus Production does uh, videos and uh, in very cheap videos. He's done heaps of videos for us in the uh, embedders in the association here. Um, Businessplans.com.au will do business plans, uh, marketing plans, etc. Um, and Nigel um, offers a 50% discount if you're a financial member of our association. <coughs> then we have Bob Bannock, and you've seen Bob over here uh, competing tonight with uh, his. Uh, adjustable enclosure system um, that was a small uh, example just to show us roughly how it works and um, these are the sort of things that he wants to prevent uh, tripping of these services pits when they kick up you know the, the ugly breaking up of the, the cement uh, the cracking of it and you know these are hazards they're ugly they're awful and there's all sorts of different shapes in the marketplace and Rob believes that his product will replace um, eventually all of those products as if you can get it marketed correctly because it has many advantages it's easier to connect up the services underneath it looks better and the adjustable lid will come down flat with the soil and not break up like the concrete does so it will always be neat and tidy and we can look forward to a little bit nicer uh, pavement environment that's how it works there, the, uh, the top screws down onto this part. Uh, here it is here screwed down. Uh, this is the section that goes into the ground and has the surfaces connected underneath and that's the uh, top. So it's simple enough but it hasn't been done. And everybody's still using all these different odd sizes made out of concrete. In May we had Ray Robotham, you've seen Ray's products over here. Concrete jointer and concrete edger. Uh, it cuts down concrete in time and leaves a better finish. <coughs> Uh, concrete, I, I don't think there's anybody here who wouldn't have concrete in their, uh, <coughs> in their, their property somewhere. Uh, most of us have concrete paths, concrete drives, um, concrete patios, so all sorts of concrete. And it's a bit of a pain to put those joints in because you have to wait for the concrete and the right way to set a bit before you can put those in. Yep. And then it's partly hard. So it's very difficult to, to do, <coughs> everybody does it, but it's a difficult job and you have to come back later and it takes more time. With Ray's system, it is so simple to do it when it's wet to, and to do nicer joints, not those big round joints. You can do those if you want to because his machine does those, but also to do nice 
uh, saw cut type joints while the concrete is wet. So it just saves time and we're all, you know, if we, if we're going to get some concrete done, you know how much it costs. It's, it costs a fortune and this can cut down on that uh, cost and uh, be extremely helpful to all the uh, tradesmen too. Um, there it is there, a very smart looking uh, tool. He's done a very good job. Um, Ray has these uh, distributed here and in the USA. And uh, when he talks together about uh, his product and my product, you know, in the concrete industry, <laughs> we might be able to do something together. Um, maybe I can get him an agent, maybe I can latch on the raise agent, but um, we're, we've got different products. Um, but we just have an interest of in this uh, concrete area. So I, I like, uh, you know, Ray's, um, uh, you know, uh, logos, etc. Uh, I think he's, uh, well presented and uh, got some great videos there. It's, it's a great product. In June, we have Peter Cooper to show us his uh, stiff strap surfboard quick locking device for car roof racks. Um, there it is, there. Uh, you can see the, the strap arrangement and on the roof rack. And what he wanted to do was um, he likes to surf, and people do get their boards pinched when they go down the pub for a counter meal, so he swipes their board from uh, the roof rack. And this would uh, be a self-locking, quick uh, locking device. There's one click and it's locked in place and simple and uh, easy. Um, Peter's not part of the competition. Um, he's uh, got some illness in his family and he has to be there. Um, in July we had uh, Trevor Perryman over here with his clear beer. Um, I love that product. I used to brew my beer and uh, I tried everything to get rid of the yeast because you know, the first glass and a half was fantastic. You know, I just didn't like the look of the, the yeast, and this is such a simple way to capture that yeast. Home brewing is a big industry around the world. It is a <coughs> mega industry around the world. Um, and, uh, and, and this is a simple system to trap the yeast <coughs> in the cap there. The cap screws onto the top of the bottle, and uh, you turn the bottle upside down, and while it's uh, creating the fermentation of the bottle to give it the gas, the yeast collects in the bottom and a little valve here will turn it off so you can trap the yeast there and you'll get a clear glass of beer compared to a cloudy glass of beer. Um, a, a, a very good, well thought out invention um, and Trevor's been on possible with this, um, just, just pushing it along. Um, and, uh, and he's part of the competition tonight. Uh, you got any tastings? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <Peter. laughs> no? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, thanks. Um, then we had Tony Barber, licensing your invention. Tony is an artist, author, illustrator, paper sculptor designer, inventor, soft toy and craft tools designer, children's literacy designer. <laughs> past bass player for Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs. <laughs> we played a black and white 1960s clip of Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs and there was Tony up there with his bass guitar, you know, um, and a very young um, Billy Thorpe. Uh, it was great to play that little clip. Oh, and the, and the girls were all screaming and fainting. And all of a sudden they charge up on the stage. The police, you know, drag him off. It was funny. So Tony was just helping us out with uh, a lot of ideas. Um, there's Tony uh, talking, and this was an easel that he developed uh, for artists, which is very unique, um, very innovative, and uh, he's currently trying to license that out. Tony said there are three types of inventions, and they're all to do with need. The first is where you create a need, the second is where you fulfill a need, and the third is where you improve a need. Then we had um, Glenn Roach. Uh, this is the third time that Glenn Roach has been and shown his inventions to the Inventors Association. Uh, I love the guy, and I think all of the new people who hadn't seen Glenn before loved him too. He's a serial inventor, drummer, tooling expert, fabricator, patenter. Um, he does a lot and um, he has a uh, pallet wrapping machine so you can uh, just walk around a pallet and wrap it with plastic. 
uh, saves a lot of backache. He, uh, <coughs> if, if you've ever seen the little things come in the mail, um, a little card from, say, your real estate agent, and it's got a magnet stuck on the back there so you can stick it on the fridge. Um, he developed a machine that will put those on at um, several hundred a minute. Um, right now, he's is the only machine in the world that does that. Everybody else has to hand stick one at a time those magnets on the back of uh, promotional literature. <coughs> so uh, he's in touch with a lot of printers, and they send their cards to him, and he sets them up, and he has it automatic, you know, with big wheels and things that you can see there. That's the um, uh, the magnet, the magnets themselves, and he takes off the uh, tape, leaving the sticky part, and they just stick on, and the next piece comes along and goes <laughs> and through hundreds of minutes. A very good product. He's also a, an excellent drummer and uh, has uh, drum stands that you can fold up and put into the back of a car, which is pretty extraordinary for a big drum stand, and a special one that. He, taps in time and, and, and it turns around and people can see him drumming from the rear and from the side, etc. Uh, then he had um, a couple of other products. This was an early product of his called the Hadley Headsets. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's just your standard cordless phone at home uh, with a Velcro uh, piece attached to it. And you just slip it in there and you can do the dishes and do anything else and put it on the phone. <laughs> he also modified that so you can do the same thing with a mobile phone. And uh, that's uh, very productive. Then we had um, Peter Boyce. Peter Boyce uh, is, um, has expertise in strategy development and in several cases helping clients to industry dominant positions. He launched Optus World in Australia and Virgin Mobile Stores. Uh, Peter has, he wanted to show us his startup, which is Ininka. It's a service product. It's a service product, and um, it's designed to show you if you will, if you are going to succeed with um, with getting uh, uh, investor funding. So he wanted this to be, he wants this to become a global brand. Um, the IP was contributed to by Professor Kevin Hindle, publisher, educator, winner of both Global Entrepreneur of the Year. Now, Peter's confident that his company can predict with an 89% reliability if your venture will succeed with funding by just going through his uh, system. You know, have you done this? Have you done that? Have you got social media? Have you got, um, you know, mentors? And then you've got the, you know, other sorts of he ticks them, you know, you've got to tick them all the boxes and you've got to go back and work hard on those if you haven't ticked the boxes. And he knows that if you've done that, um, you will succeed. Um, he wants to share this with banks because uh, the banks can use this to find out if a person coming to them, asking for funds, uh, if their business will succeed. So it's a pretty big uh, deal. Peter shared his new website with us for the first time and I noticed today that it's not operating. So I guess inventors are not the only ones who have problems, and even the foolproof system from a high flyer is not in trouble. Uh, Peter was an excellent speaker, we learned a lot, and I hope he eventually has success with this product. In September we had something different. We had Dr. Ian Watkins, who was on our committee, with My Failed Inventions. An interesting and humorous journey of some great inventions that did not make it. Now this is a range of inventions that Ian is working on. The ones in red uh, fail. There we go, there we go, there we go, there we go. The ones in black he's still working on. And he wasn't going to tell us much about those because he's still working on them. Um, so you can see it goes from dewatering a brown coal, cheaper LED lights, focus to x-ray equipment for cancer treatment. Uh, communication devices for deaf people, camping equipment, time saving, concrete slab, construction equipment, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. I mean, uh, what, is, what, what do you don't do? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, we're very impressed. And uh, there you go, it's very entertaining, very good slideshow. Uh, we all uh, really enjoyed that. We followed through all of the things. Uh, here's one example. Now, this is a torch that gives. 70% rise a light. 
And he did that by um, eliminating this wasted light that goes out here because it hits the reflector, which is of a special design, reflects it back to here and shoots it out the front. Um, he also used the globe with uh, krypton gas. Is that right, Ian? That's, krypton gas? That's the, um, the way they improved the, on the basic one. Oh. So it can be used as well in this. So it can, can be used yeah. in this as well because uh, that will allow the uh, globe to shine brighter. So anyway, 70% brighter um, torch. Now, that failed because we had LED torches. Out. They're much brighter, they take almost no energy, <laughs> and unfortunately for Ian, they wrecked his invention. Well, anyway, he put a lot of work into that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we went through uh, a few of those things now. Um, uh, he was talking now about a security device for um, governments or uh, you know, uh, defence, etc using quantum entanglement um, and work out the uh, problem first using finite dimensional linear, linear algebra. Uh, there it is there, very simple to follow. Um, consider two non-interacting systems A and B, um, go down here, go across there, and therefore the march of the arrow of time towards thermodynamic equilibrium is simply the growing spread of quantum entanglement. Symbols. Thanks, Ian. We've got a very uh, large insight into your inventive capability, which uh, you really are in all of In October, we had uh, Bill Allardyce uh, talking to us about Taipei International Inventor Show and Technomat. Uh, Bill showed us a product, a small product, that um, he popped on the desk and he shone the keyboard and as he typed on the uh, light keyboard on the desk, it uh, sent a message in his phone. So that was uh, pretty interesting. And, uh, there he is. He's good old jovial self. Uh, thank you, Bill. <laughs> Next, um, after we... Bill's wife. <laughs> <laughs> So what do you say? Anyway, uh, after uh, I've gone through now uh, our guest speakers and inventors who presented products, and then we had um, a couple of famous Australian inventors which we put on those in there too, and talk about it because it's good at the meeting to just spend ten minutes on a famous Australian inventor. Uh, the famous Australian inventor Frank McEnroe invented the Chico Roller in 1951. And 28 years later, when he passed away, his company was selling 40 million per year in Australia, with another 1 million plus going to Japan. The Chico Roller was openly held in one hand while holding a beer in the other and was consumed at the football, race meetings, shows, and similar events. He launched it at the Wagga Show because uh, Frank had a civil service uh, business with his brothers, uh, and he travelled down to all the country shows uh, with their business, and then he developed a Chico roll and it really took off. So uh, that was one inventor. Uh, the next is the inventor of the flight recorder, the Black Fox flight recorder. Uh, David Warren was an Australian scientist, best known for inventing and developing the flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder. Um, uh, David developed the product here in Melbourne, I believe, there in Nautical Laboratories, and uh, nobody in Australia was interested in it. So, uh, a visiting person from the UK to the laboratories uh, was told about it, and he jumped on it. Went back to England, uh, employed David, and he it, they developed it, and then it went on from there. Uh, in 2010, David Warren passed away, and uh, on his coffin they had a label that said, Inventor of the Black Box Flight Recorder, do not open. <laughs> 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 so, 
So uh, that, that completes our year, basically. Um, but uh, something else we, we found um, in, in some inventions uh, from the past was um, an apparatus for facilitating the birth of a child by centrifugal force. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I took some, uh, some lines from the copy, you know, and just sort of put them together. Uh, I certainly didn't you know, include everything, but it is known that due to natural anatomical conditions, the fetus needs the application of considerable propelling force. Now, it's the primary purpose of the present invention to provide an apparatus which will assist the under-equipped woman. Now, it, this is 1965, and it was the husband and wife who developed this, and uh, the under-equipped woman meant that they weren't working in the fields and having very strong abdominal muscles, etc. Because apparently they never had any trouble with childbirth. Apparently. And, um, you know, more refined ladies who didn't do any work um, could have a problem. So he wanted to, um, as he says here, uh, assist the under equipped woman by creating a gentle, evenly distributed, properly directed, precision control force that acts in unison with and supplements her own efforts. There it is. <laughs> it's like one of those <laughs> wizzy-dizzy machines in the background. You know? And uh, they put a stretcher on there and so forth. And uh, with an electric motor, it's uh, driven. And they have um, a big, I don't know, any engineers have seen those regulators above uh, steam boilers with two big balls and, and a thing that, you know, as it spins faster, the balls go out and it stops the thing from over spinning. That was part of the device. Anyway, um, there is a set of balls in the middle. That's what caused the issue in the first place. <laughs> In accordance with the invention, there is provided rotatable apparatus capable of subjecting the mother and fetus to a centrifugal force. When in the operation of the machine, the operator reaches a rate of rotation at which the combination of pressures produced both by the created centrifugal force and by the mother exceed the childbirth resisting forces, the movement of the fetus occurs and the child is delivered into net 88. <laughs> While in the net, the child is still subjected to the action of a centrifugal force and is caused by such force to firmly press against the elastic bottom of the net 88. As the elastic cables 89 and the net give somewhat to this force, the cotton wad 97 in the net is pressed by the child against the switch lever 93, which is actuated, actuated to cut the power to the motor 15, and it may also be utilised to activate an electric bell. Ding ding! It's right. <laughs> um, <coughs> announcing the event. Now the operator then applies the handbrake, if he hasn't gone for coffee, <laughs> 18, to gently bring the machine to a complete stop. So you see, it was completely safe. <laughs> Um, I think that's 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 it. Oops, well um, what I want to do now is uh, show you a modern invention. Um, <coughs> present day. Now this invention was developed by a Dutch university student, and I think um, it's a beautiful. Thank you. 
graduate student at the TU Delft working on a project for Living Tomorrow and UZ Gent. Our vision is to improve current emergency infrastructure with a network of drones capable of saving lives. At over 100 km per hour, these drones create an ultra-fast response system capable of increasing this survival chance from 8% to 80%. This is because the ambulance drone is not affected by the current road infrastructure, but is capable of flying in a straight line, bringing down the average response time of an ambulance from 10 minutes to 1. We developed a new type of drone that is capable of folding into a very compact position. The drone essentially becomes a flying toolbox for your emergency supplies. Using advanced production techniques such as 3D printed microstructures and carbon fiber frame construction, we were able to achieve a very lightweight design. Our iterative process using design sketching, laser cutting and CNC milling allowed us to rapidly visualize our ideas. The result is an integrated solution that is clear in its orientation and friendly in appearance. Let's use drones for a good purpose. Let us use drones to save lives. Shepard, if you would come up. Rod Shepard, uh, you come up, Rod. Rod is going to just tell us what, what happened with last year's winner uh, invention, which was Pump Defender. Um, this is the trophy. Uh, the winner will have their name engraved on the trophy, and uh, they can keep it at home for 12 months, as long as they bring it back every month to the meeting. <laughs> and uh, the following year, somebody else. We'll have their name engraved. <coughs> so I'll hand over a lot. Thank you. Hey, Ben's asked me to talk about um, the updates of the Pump Defender, the uh, product that I won last year's Inventor of the Year award with. And uh, so let me first uh, start this update by uh, framing it in terms of who is my customer. Well, basically, it's anybody who has a firefighting pump. So that includes people who are. Can you hear me up the back? Yeah. yeah. And that includes people who are rural and semi living in semi-rural areas, and also anyone who has a uh, transfer pump. Um, <coughs> oh, instantly, for those of you who don't know, the, uh, the pump defender is essentially a product that employs a custom sprinkler arrangement that goes over the top of, that sprays water over the top of firefighting pumps, uh, protecting those firefighting pumps on uh, bushfire days uh, during bushfire events. And it also helps prevent transfer pumps from from starting fires at night events. <coughs> so over the last year, my needs uh, for pump protector have been, and <coughs> remain, money. Money to employ some kind of independent validation for the product. For instance, you know, an arm's length um, testing agency like CSIRO to validate the product so that it uh, has some sort of uh, evidentiary proof that it, that it works in certain criteria. Uh, money for tooling, money for marketing, money for packaging, and money for distribution. Distribution. Build it, and they will come. I think we all know that's a bit of a delusion. So finding to what, a way to reach our potential customers is utterly crucial. We pump the fender. People don't realise they have a problem with their fire pumps in bushfire situations until it's too late. Then, they, of course, they realise that their pump has failed just when they need it the most. 
And because these rural, semi-rural people are, I'm sure there's a, there's a number of them, but they're a disparate lot. You know, they all have their own interests and their own uh, uh, demographic sense. Educating this customer base is very expensive. <coughs> now, of course, the CFA are best positioned more so than anybody to, for the pump defender to reach these people. But the CFA is actually notoriously reactionary and certainly they're not proactive. So you might think, well, why not sell it in retail? Well, 90 to 95% of those people already, who already own a pump, a firefighting pump, aren't looking for a new pump. So why would they go into a store? So retail really, it's, it's quite a small, soft, small segment of the market for us. It's only of the order of you know, 5 to 10%. So this difficulty to reach and educate the customer, I think, exemplifies the, the contrast between uh, commercialising game-changing inventions, like, like the pump defender perhaps, and incremental innovations, um, such as improvements to an existing product where the, where the marketing and distribution channels already exist. In terms of the actions I've taken over the last year, I've spent a lot of time trying to cut deals and to attract uh, wider interest in, in my product. So although, although just 5 to 10% of my customers um, uh, are looking for a new pump, pump manufacturers, those that supply new pumps, they already have distribution in place. Uh, so I pitched to them, um, again looking for money to help me develop product and you know, market research on packaging and so forth. But really, I was quite undercooked. They, I think, were searching for a product that was fully resolved, and they could just put it just straight into their distribution chain. They weren't really interested in, um, in investing. <coughs> Possibly because you end up pitching to middle management much of the time, and their risk appetite perhaps isn't anything like that of an entrepreneur or inventor. I, uh, I, Cut a kind of a backdoor deal with the Chief Fire Commissioner, a good bloke called, you might have heard of him, Craig Lapsley. Uh, there was some money under a, a driving business innovation grant for government agencies to help solve uh, endemic problems they have within their organisations. Um, cut a long story short, we, uh, we gave it a red hot go, but alas, we're unsuccessful. I then um, applied for the AMP Tomorrow Fund, which had a little bit of money. Um, and a lot of pump defender became a finalist out of 5,600 or thereabouts applicants. So I was ultimately unsuccessful on that. <laughs> ultimately unsuccessful though. Um, the second year running, I applied uh, for the Fire Awareness Awards again for Pump Defender. Uh, once again, unsuccessful. And as uh, some of you have may have uh, also applied for, I applied Pump Defend for the Shark Tank TV show coming to a TV station near you, Channel 10, next year. Much along the lines of um, um, Dragon's Den. Dragon's Den, thank you very much, which is coming to Australia on Channel 10. So I got through to the audition stage, um, but alas, once again, unsuccessful and missed out on the on uh, season one, although they did suggest for rare flight in season two. So just like Thomas Edison said about product development, I haven't failed 10,000 times, I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. So the future, well, I'll continue to come up with, or try to come up with creative and hopefully savvy deals to pitch to strategic partners. And I'm, uh, I'm weighing up uh, the possibility of uh, starting a crowdfunding campaign. But as I said before, there are particularly difficult demographic, the rural and semi-rural people, to, to try and put in one box, to find them in one place. Um, because crowdfunding, crowdfunding, of course, is, uh, is dependent on a bring your own crowd um, to, 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 the, to the funding platform. And, um, and even if I don't reach target, I, uh, I will gain some, you know, some market learnings along the way and, uh, and, and obviously some sales because the price points are rather low. It's, you know, like retail's now 50 bucks or under 50 bucks delivered. And perhaps if I don't reach target, I'll tip in the balance myself. 
So over the last six years of being pretty much a full-time inventor, what have I learned? Well, I've, I've learned that inventing isn't about the thing. The thing, well, that's easy. It's certainly fun. But instead, really, it's, it's about commercialising. And that's not easy. Not easy at all. And it's really, it's not so much fun either. But that's what needs to be done. I've learned that I need to be, become an excellent marketer, <coughs> an excellent salesperson. Because when you've got no sales, the numbers don't talk. Only the individual can talk. Or I need to be an excellent deal maker, or both. So my fellow inventors, <laughs> never lose your momentum. Stay consistent and stay tenacious. After all, as Winston Churchill once said, the definition of success is going from one failure to another with no loss of enthusiasm. Thanks. Good luck to you all. Okay, well, we've got to that part of the meeting now where um, uh, I'd like all the uh, inventors to line up and uh, just do a quick interview and uh, they can say a few words to us all. And uh, I want you to take note of the number of each invention. Now it starts up there, one is at the top, five is at this end. So you need to put in the number and, if possible, the name of the invention that you want to vote for. Product, the adjustable enclosure system. Um, as I pointed out in the presentation, um, you see those ugly service bits all over the place, and it's a big problem to industry too. So um, I'll hand over to Rob. What can you tell us about it, Rob? Well, uh, as Peter said, it's uh, it's something that probably people don't think about much on a day-to-day -day basis, but pits enclosures uh, around everywhere. There's millions of them. So as you walk up and down the street, you mightn't realise that you're standing on a piece of uh, capital equipment that a power company or a telephone company spent a lot of money on. And for years and years and years, uh, you probably don't, don't appreciate some people around here, some of them would be uh, a lot older than uh, perhaps the pits that are actually in the ground. They can stay there for a long, long time. So, John? John? Dear John, um, so the, the thing about it is that there is stuff out there that we pay lots and lots of money for to keep uh, maintained. Telephone company stuff, a power company stuff, and they come in different shapes and sizes. You wouldn't think a hole in the ground would be worth so much money. And the thing that I'm addressing is one of the key building blocks that a lot of companies have. It's the pits, the enclosures in the ground. Year by year, if you go back to the 30s, 40s and 50s, people were putting them in, they were suited to size and shape. They went to the 50s, 60s, 70s, size and shape, all very different, all very unique. The only problem with that is that uh, as time goes on, this variety, this variation of enclosures that we have to store all this equipment keeps growing. So a lot of companies are spending a lot of money not only to install the stuff, but maintaining it 30, 40 years down the track. If you stand back from it, and that's, I had an opportunity to do that, but I used to work for a telephone company for 35 years, stood back and looked at it. Why, you say, why can't we actually standardise what we're doing and make things simpler? And that's what I've done. I've looked at it, and when you think about what happens to a pit in the ground, it's normally one fixed unit, it can't be adjusted or uh, amended or changed very easily. What I've done is stood back from that and said, okay, let's look at providing some flexibility. So rather than having one particular piece of plastic that you put in today, or you might have put it in 40 years ago, it can't be adjusted or not really that easily adjusted. What I've done is actually uh, formed it in two portions, a, a base and a top, which provides a lot of flexibility, not only for the initial installation, but the long-term maintenance of it. The benefit of that is that if you get the telephone companies, power companies, the water companies, the whole lot of them to start, at, which we all think is, makes good sense, they should, there should be some synergies, some common standards applied. If they're able to draw on something like my invention to provide that standard, 
and in the format that I've got with a, uh, a trustable component, a top and a base, it will be there for the long term uh, of that the space that you need. So <coughs> that's the, uh, the invention, Peter. Thank you very much, uh, Rob. Uh, this is number one, the adjustable enclosure system. So uh, mark your cards accordingly. Debbie Dash, past president of the uh, IAA, with Toibo. And uh, I think I've already said a few words about it up there. I'll hand straight over to you, Debbie, because you're much better at it than I am. So what can you tell us about it? Well, very basically, Toibo is a versatile storage solution. And to start it off with all is that it's a toy box, a dress-up box, or a beauty box for the preteen. But not only that, it, it has other industry sector applications. We have a, a cat bow, a baby bow, and a doggy bow. So it's really a versatile sort of solution in that. Uh, but tonight I'm just using this, but as I said, there's other applications. So. We have three tiers of, of storage. We have a removable box that then becomes the um, different sections that you can place your kids in. <coughs> if it's a teenager, you've got the, the added advantage of a mirror for the for the beauty part of it. The preteen just stores all their stuff in it, closes the lid, and away we go. But often preteens don't want to get rid of their precious little toys, and little things that are just theirs from their babyhood. And probably this is where the, the um, invention started, was because my youngest daughter, who wasn't able to be here tonight, is now a big girl. And um, we moved and, and she was growing up and it was like, well, out with the little baby stuff and in with the, with the new, what could I store all her things in? And then I realised that we, still, we were still at the baby sector and she was growing up, and what do you do with those things that, that are still precious to her from her babyhood? So there comes the, the idea of, of making um, a toy box, a baby thing, into a preteen solution, and uh, that's where the idea came. And then it, it just basically grew from, well, we can, from, from the little toddler, you can have um, accessories, you can have a chalkboard kit, and over the other side of here we have. Um, the accessories, we have a chalkboard kit, da -da -da -da. we have a, a little um, <coughs> drip lacquer that just rubs all the, all the chalk off, so it becomes interactive. And then I thought about just, you know, when you put the top box to the middle, middle bit and, and down to the bottom drawer, just to put a little decal around, which is like another accessory, it looks good without it, but it probably looks even better with it. So. But the thing was, a few years ago, I always thought that it was going to be made in plastic. Plastic was the go, the tooling and all the rest of it, but it proved to be too expensive. So I spent really a few years just always perusing, looking, looking, looking on the internet for new mediums to make my product in. And then eventually I came across the idea of using cardboard because, you know, your, your children taught at school about environmentally friendly you know, mediums and, and so forth. So I started investigating, I spoke to Ray about it and uh, we had, we sort of thought, well, we'll go cardboard. And then really to confirm that, we actually found in our research there were, it's the beginnings of a cardboard world, that uh, there are beds and office units and drawers and all sorts of things actually being made in cardboard, but still not a toy box. So I'm the world's first storage solution for toy boxes in cardboard and there's nothing like this in the world. Uh, so then very basically, you know, one idea leads to another and then becomes an innovation of other applications, other industry <coughs> sectors that this can be applied for. And um, yes, and I, very good idea when my little puppy dog jumped in the middle of the middle section and sort of thought this was fun and uh, she rather liked that and then the, the pussycat jumped in and we thought, oh, that's even better. So. Um, then you start realising that there are lots of countries, particularly the USA, that would really, uh, that live in apartments that could afford this sort of one size storage solution for the puppy dog, the, the pussy cat, and also too, not forgetting little humans, we have a baby box. So I've actually sold some this 
unit as being a baby box for the newborn, as a perfect gift from the grandparent to the to the mother to be. And you know, you hold your little cotton balls and your uh, powders and solutions and all sorts of things, as us mums know what we all need. And then of course we have the clothes and nappies and, and everything. So it really does make a terrific gift. And really, it's it's. For the kids, it's a great way of teaching them to pack up. It's a great way of owning it because you can have your little hooks to, on the side to hold your little hats and, or to hold you know, scarves and you know, obviously light things. And just the concept is, is terrific. So there's lots of industry sector applications and I think that's probably the value of the product is, is in those sectors. And uh, that's it. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, um, you can see this here then, this made me think I made a very big mistake and I didn't announce you up there on the screen, that's because we haven't done the newsletter for November yet and you were our November inventor. Too recent. Um, so I'm very sorry that I didn't give you, um, you know, some more um, advantage of, of, of having you up there. Um, so, so I think essentially this is um, Black River, is it? Yep. Black River, which is a collection of water in the outback, for instance, um, just using our roadways. Uh, you want to tell us yep. about it, thing? Yeah, uh, thanks, Pete. Um, yeah, Black River, for obvious reasons, in the, the asphalt roads are black. So I'm thinking you can look at the, the 3,000 kilometres across the Nullarbor Plain as a as a source of water. If you look at, think about it. Uh, there's a huge amount of water falls on our roads. Um, if if we collected every last drop on an average of road in Australia, it amounts to approximately just on the average road. Uh, some roads would be even higher, but some will be lower. But on an average road, it's a swimming pool, an Olympic swimming pool full for every kilometre. That's if you captured every last drop, you had no evaporation and all that. So obviously that won't happen, but there's going to be an awful lot of water that you could capture. And so the concept is quite simple. And I, I've been, uh, Patsy and I love uh, travelling around the outback Australia, and we've done many tens of thousands of K. And I've driven down there's roads, and there's obviously just no water anywhere. You occasionally you'll come across a cattle station. But the cattle stations are 200 kilometres down off the main road because they're situated where there's a spring or a bore or something like that. So the, these stations, industries are locating themselves where the water is. Well, why not locate it where the conveniences are, such as on a main road like the Sturt Highway or something. There's a beautiful highway linking one end of the country to the other. So there's infrastructure, there's the highway, there's usually electricity, the mains power, high, high tension line also runs along the track, there's off usually communications, it's got everything except water. So many industries and ones we would only consider in um, the more moist parts of the land, the eastern states of Australia, could consider, you know, going down into the central area. Because they're looking for the water. Often these industries may be a little bit noxious, you know, they might have smell a bit that people don't want them at their, in their backyard, like the chook farming, the pig farming, cattle, with blow fires and all sorts of things associated with But, so here we go, we can, you could take a road, and I assume this would probably be, good, good, uh, I still have to look at how this would be um, uh, marketed, but I'm thinking probably uh, the government, like the South Australian government or something like that, um, take the concert and they would sell to people. They would say, right, oh, we're, we're offering attendance for 1,000 kilometres of the Sturt Highway. And anyone, I go, what's your bid? So cattle station says, right, that's right. We're 200 k off the road. We would say 200 k's of dra dragging down some gravelly road um, for a start, with just a fuel problem there alone is a saving. Why don't we just be right on the side of the highway and we, um, we can 
we can now introduce something more intense too. We can have we could introduce feed lighting or something, not just gradual grazing over ten thousand mm -hmm. kilometers of uh, they could actually spray the ground. So so if you can co collect the water, which the system hopefully might do, um, you could uh, let's say a cattle station could say, right, I, I want to I take 20 kilometres of road, so these little pits are draining the water off the road because the edge of the road, the key to it, the road is not just a, a painted white strip, it's actually got a, a thickness, maybe 10 mil or something like that, so it's accumulating, damming the water a little bit, enough to make it drain down into these little culverts and down into a little tank underneath. And that, no doubt these would have to be, someone would have to experiment as to the, to the edge conditions of rainfall in that particular area and whatever, as to the, the best distance apart for these temporary channels, uh, tanks and so forth. Um, so that's the way it works. So this little, um, this uh, pressure pipe, that could run for hundreds of kilometres, linking lots of little tanks and then every so often, 20 k's down the track, the cattle farm taps off and they have their big uh, storage tanks or underground tanks or a dam or whatever they want and they can utilize it. So there we go. It's a capture rain off the road. Fantastic and uh, congratulations on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, very, very good. Well you know, demonstrated, the, the piping up there and uh, the tanks, etc. Uh, I'm sorry that I didn't put it up. Later, no worries. But, uh, You've done a good job of uh, presenting that. Thank you. Now, on to the man who's not going to give me any free beer. <laughs> I love homebrew. It's so much better than a normal beer. Um, so Trevor Perryman with his product here, Clear Beer, um, which is the, uh, the way of capturing the yeast. Uh, Trevor, would you like to tell us about it, and, uh, what potential it has? Thanks, Peter. And look, I, I think uh, some of the commentary tonight is all about uh, the difficulty in trying to get your your uh, product up and running. And marketing, I think, was mentioned as the key thing. And I've I've let myself down horribly. It was suggested I should have brought uh, home brew for everyone, and I would have got the price <laughs> So I'm complete failure, and perhaps that's why I'm here standing here with a prototype and it's not out on the shelves. But uh, very simply, I think Peter sort of summarised it quite well earlier on that this is a what I call the clear beer uh, bottle cap, and it's designed to capture yeast that normally uh, drops out in the uh, home brewing exercise, normally in the bottom of the bottle. Uh, normally during home brew, the bottle is up like that. It ferments, uh, produces bubbles for us home brewers, and then you end up with uh, crud at the bottom, which is basically just yeast. And when you go to pour your beer, you usually end up with a, the last glass that's quite muddy. And the idea in this cap is that you ferment the bottle inverted, uh, the yeast instead of falling there falls down here and then you have a valve that isolates the yeast from the rest of the beer uh, and then you can turn it the right way up and uh, the beer is completely clear uh, and all the crud as you can see which is pretty horrible uh, sits up the top. So it's quite a simple you know, device. Um, the journey for this has been quite long. Um, I'm embarrassed to say how long it is so I won't but it is a long <laughs> It's a long journey. Um, I think a couple of comments tonight was, was that you know keep the motivation up and keep your enthusiasm up. Uh, over a long period of time, it certainly goes like this. Uh, you, you do you do um, uh, meet a lot of interesting people and uh, very encouraging people. For me, Ray, uh, member of the, the uh, association here, has been a great support to me, and also my friends and family have been a great support. My journey's not over. Um, you know, I've got a prototype here. Uh, I've tried some crowdfunding which wasn't a success but I did get some good leads but I think another thing that was said tonight is that really trying to get your product as far down the track as you can so that when you do go to a middle manager uh, or a, a, a top manager in a company that has the marketing tools available, has the distribution tools available, then they can just say uh, yes I'll, I'll take a thousand of those and you're off and running. Um, and I think if I can leave um, some optimism I've been thinking about tonight is that uh, with the innovation of 3D printing, prototypes like this become that much more 
um, achievable, you know, within within a reasonable cost. I mean, when I did look at this, uh, I was going to say years, but perhaps decades ago, um, <laughs> you know, I was I was spending a fortune, you know, a thousand dollars or something like that for that thing. That that um, it, you know, it kind of worked, but it wasn't really commercial, you know. Whereas uh, if you if, if as we, I think as technology goes along with 3D printing in my case, in this particular product's case, then that, that makes a crazy idea achievable very quickly. You can visualise it and then you can say, yes, it'll work. No, it's not. We can change it this way and that way. So I think there's actually a lot of optimism for inventors in the future uh, for these kinds of things. So um, anyway, back to that. I, 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 hope you, I hope you appreciate that. And, uh, and look, it's been a privilege just to get up here. And, uh, and thanks to Ray and thanks to Peter for supporting supporting me. So, with this product, what's the potential of it? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, what, the motivation that I, I do come back to every now and then is I look, look back at my earlier, earlier um, figures is that um, I, I estimate there's about a, a million uh, off and on home brewers, uh, uh, well no, sorry, a million paid up members of the American Home Brewers Association. So. Out of that, you can probably say that there's probably 10 to 15, maybe around 20 million home brewers in America. In Australia, it's more like say 300,000. Um, and I think I think the thing with this product is that I've got to get it down the price right down below a couple of bucks, probably under a dollar fifty. And if I can get it at that level, I think then it becomes um, in the stores nothing to think about. You know, a home brewer they're, normally they're pretty they're either really keen as a hobbyist. Or they're really miserable and they don't want to spend anything. But if you make it under a couple of bucks and it's reusable and they'd have to buy 60 of them, right, you know, to, to, um, to get, have a, a sort of a, a rotation of it, then they probably wouldn't think about it over the time. So I think there is still promise for it, but you know, it's, it's a, a long hard road. And, uh, but at the same time, it's fun. Uh, it, it is a bit, uh, you know, it stretches the. Uh, the friendship at home sometimes when I say, oh, I think I'll spend another thousand bucks on that. They go, what? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of fun, it's a bit of hobby. But truly, if you want to get serious about it, I think you've got to throw everything um, in terms of energy at it. Uh, you've just got to be, you know, it, it's up. again, it comes back to the prototypes and the ideas of it. It, it can tie a lot of money up and you can go broke quickly and, you know, end up divorced and out of your home and all that sort of jazz on an idea which is not a good idea. <laughs> So you, you're not actually in the brewing industry, but you're in an alloy. Yeah, I, I personally, yeah, I, I was a brewer, and that's where I got this idea initially. Uh, and now I'm in the malting industry, so I sell malt for my, for my uh, to pay for things like this. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I sort of understand it. But um, um, yeah, so right. my, thank my, you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are they washable or reusable, or do you throw them away with each crew? No, they're washable and reusable. Yeah. Yeah. Clean your ears out, Bill. <laughs> now, uh, Ray, Ray Botham with um, his concrete jointer and edger. Uh, Ray, I, I love the product, of course. Um, I just think it looks great. Um, I love all the design of these things and the way they work. Uh, what can you tell us? Oh yeah, well, uh, I'm Ray, everyone, and uh, I'll see everyone tonight. Um, thanks, Pat. So yeah, this is pretty much the uh, power control joint tool, which is called the Robo Joiner. It replaces the old way. We used to have to punch in this heavy sort of uh, cast tool here, which you pretty much just have to get on the concrete and run along the straight edge and punch it in. And once the concrete firms up, it's pretty hard to actually install your, your joints. Um, I designed the, the first off was the, was the rolled radius plate, which is it's got a bit of a three quarter inch uh, radius here. Um, and that's pretty much a standard uh, joint for your pavement on, you know, on your footpaths and stuff. <coughs> Secondly, I came to think, well, um, how about trying it for the saw cut? You'll see your, your pavement in sort of larger areas that has your saw cut joint, which is about five millimetres, depending if, if the diamond blade wears too much. Um, That's a nice neat cut, isn't it? Yeah, this one's just more streamlined, uh, less, I guess, if I'm bypassing stuff like that, um, when you're 
yeah, when you're going over the divots, this thing, this uh, profile here, it's a little bit wider, so it creates a bit more noise, and it's uh, not so smooth. But um, yeah, so I guess this one here is a, a you know, smoother ride on your skateboard or your, your push bike or whatever. Um, yeah, so we have the reason why it's actually better to install your joints <coughs> the same day is because when you lay a concrete slab, uh, it, it shrinks once it starts drying out. So if you get your control joints cut in the same day, as per have to wait to come back, the new technology, they come back the next day or really late that night, and um, no one wants to come back to the job. Pretty much you want to pull a cash and dash, grab your cash and run, and, uh, <coughs> and not return. So, um, and then if they do it too late, or if they call in a, a cutter um, yeah. the next day after 24 hours, it's already. Well, it's that's right. Once, you, once your concrete's already, you know, the moisture's gone, it's shrunk, it's shrinking, that's when it pulls away from the material. And if you haven't got your control joint in that day, it's very prone to cracking overnight. So we've made this so you can <coughs> do larger areas and, um, yeah, get it done the same day. It's about 70% faster than the, the old conventional way. And, and with uh, the worst thing is if you put down a driveway and um, it's a beautiful job, and they come in too late, uh, as you said, they don't want to come back late at night and do it. So they come back the next day and it's too late, it's already dried out. And they put the joints in, and a year later you find all these cracks in the driveway, not where the joints are, but somewhere else. And yeah, right. it ruins the finish of the whole drive. Yeah, concrete pretty You much. don't see it straight away. Um, it happens, you know, over about 12 months. <laughs> well, well, yeah, really concrete, yeah. it really gets real light fracture lines. And if you don't install them within, you know, it's really 12 hours, that what they say. But, I mean, I've been in the concrete industry for about, oh, about 18 years. And, um, you know, like, you need to really get them in the same day. It's uh, come back the next day and you have cracks through your concrete. And that's when what happens when they come back with the saw cut. The concrete isn't hard enough and they run the saw cut through it. It just flings out rocks and makes it all chipped and everything. But the way we can use with this saw cut profile here is we have, have a nice and crisp and a nice straight line which does not... Which chip. is strong on the edges. It's strong, it's compact. It actually compacts the rock, the aggregate. And cement and tells it where it wants to crack instead of just cutting through the wheel. Um, you know, the wheel's only going through the top of it. This is compacting the whole aggregate and everything to try to tell the job where it's going to crack. We want you to crack here, that's what it's trying so, to do. So, in the past, we had for a very long time that tool for making the joints in the concrete. Yep, for a long time. Then, diamond cutting machines were developed yep. and then people came back the next day and started cutting the joints but it was a big problem because they were already cracked That's in the right. wrong places when they cut it because it took too long and then the next uh, evolution was the soft cut wasn't it yeah, the soft cut can be done it can be done the same day but depending on what jobs you actually do you need to really burn finish with a power cell <laughs> to make it a very hard finish to be able to to do a soft cut saw. If you if you do a soft cut saw on a soft finish, like a just a you call it like a broom finish that day, you definitely you'll have edges chipping and loose aggregate <coughs> falling out. So, so now after the soft cut evolution, we've got the Robo tool. That's it, the Robo joiner. And the Robo joiner. It's actually now a four in one tool. So we have not only the first two, you know, the, the radius joint and the saw cut, we made a uh, <coughs> world first power edger. So it does all your edge work as well. It's the outside. It does your, yeah, it, what, your form work, it runs off your form work at your height, and this is actually just a prototype we're, we're into. The form work <coughs> is that bit of wood on the outside to stop the Yeah, your form work, your, your edges that hold your concrete up straight, so you've got a nice straight edge. But a lot of people, well, everywhere, they like to have a nice radius edge keep it neat. So this runs along your formwork, clings down your formwork and 
punches in your radius edge. So we're into manufacturing that at the moment, but this is just a prototype. So then we went to the guys in America, we're actually selling them in America. I've got a, a master distributor there, and a few of the guys like they're selling, uh, okay, I guess we've sold 300 units there. And a bit of feedback is oh, they want to use the tool without having to get on the concrete. So, so we designed we designed this clamp. It goes around the tool. And these are all battery operated. There's no cord yeah, across right. the, the, the The cordless this thing has a um, has a uh, accelerator cable. It runs around here, goes up the pole and to wherever length you want really as far you can reach about. 10, I've had up to 10 metres, so you can get to it from the outside of the job without having to get on with in this video you've seen. Did everybody see that, uh, the way the pole works? Everybody, everybody. So it's pretty much a, it's pretty much a clamp, <coughs> two cam logs here that snap off, undoes there, throw everything else away, and then you can use it as a hand tool, back to your hand tool status. So uh, yeah, it pretty much saves um, the concreter a lot of time, effort, money, and it uh, yeah it retails for six fifty. So fantastic! All right, thanks very much, Ray. Right. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Cast your votes. Pick up the, uh, the voting system. Is it three, two, one, or one, two, three? Uh, the first, the first one is your first choice for number one. The person you think should be the winner. That's uh, where's boys my car. So, um, so the one on top, the one you put down first, is the one for first place. The one you put down second will be second place. The one you put down uh, under that will be third place. <laughs> Okay, everybody, take your seats, please. We've come to the finale of the evening. We have uh, three winners, third, second, and first. So uh, the boys have counted all of the votes. Um, each of the winners was uh, fairly clear. Uh, everybody got a good number of votes. And uh, for third place, we have Trevor Perryman. Trevor, you can Congratulations, Trevor. Thank you. Stay here. Um, just will check for yourself. And um, a certificate. Well done. Thank you very much. Now. Second place is Rob Bannock. Congratulations, Rob. Thank you very much. Full check for you. Thank you. <laughs> And uh, a certificate. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, for first place, the winner of this year's Inventor of the Year 2014. Drum roll. Goes to a commercial break. Come on, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> You've been working out with the brother. Not these two. <laughs> the winner goes to Ray Robotham. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Congratulations, mate. Well done. Is that a small check for you? And uh, Inventor of the Year. And you get to get your name engraved on our trophy. That is now yours. see everyone here and um, yeah thanks to who voted and uh, thanks for the little uh, entourage over here that popped down <laughs> and um, yeah I'd just like to thank everyone and uh, congratulate you on the uh, second and third and um, yeah well good luck to all you inventors out there it's uh, not easy but just keep at it and never give in and um, thanks everyone I'm in the joining our association. <laughs> I am. I'm pretty happy with uh, yeah, people making them come down. But, um, that's my job to go around those places and sort of grab blokes like you. Well, we accidentally. <laughs> that, that was accident. It was accidental uh, bumping into each other, and it's great to see that there's something like this you know, for other people that you know don't know actually how to do or, or how to get there. You know, it's great for everyone to come get together once a month. You know, pass ideas around and, and try and help each other and that's what it's all about. And uh, yeah, I'd like to thank my my parents. Dennis, he was the one that trained me into the uh, concrete industry. And he's the one that made me get very upset to actually uh, want to try and do that job a little bit easier. So I'd like to thank the old man too. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 